Um, we're going to do a message tonight, and I've entitled it, and I want to be clear, I'll try and explain this to Brother Randy uh, when he was asking me my title. I want to do it the right way. Um, I'm speaking for Pastor Bobby. I'm just giving y'all uh, enough chance now to make plans. I'll be speaking on uh, Sunday morning and Sunday night as well for Pastor Bobby, and so I don't have a three-part message. I have three separate messages, but they all have the same title. And the title is, When Were You Last Changed? Um, <clears throat> we all know that we were changed at salvation. I trust as I look around tonight, I believe everybody in here professes to be saved. I believe everybody in here has um, professed to a saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we know that there was a change that came in our life at that time. But what I wanted to ask tonight, what I'm going to ask Sunday morning and Sunday night, is when were we last changed? Because here's the thing, at salvation we are made righteous in the eyes of God. The blood of Jesus Christ covers all the sins that we've ever committed and are ever going to. But that's not the, if that was the end of it, and I'm sure you've heard this said before, if that was the entire purpose of it, then the moment we got saved, Jesus would call us up to heaven. Because it was an accomplishment. We got done what needed to be done. But that's not the purpose of salvation. Um, the purpose of salvation is to make us, um, through the blood of Christ, righteous enough to be able to serve God, to change our nature and have us to do what he would have us to do here on this world. Some people, he may leave here for 70, 80, 90 years after salvation. Some may pass within weeks or days of salvation. We don't know, but our responsibility is to as Paul says, to finish the race that was given to us. Um, one of the only times, you know, we can have, we're all running a race, but everybody's race is a different length. And we all get the same reward for finishing that race correctly. And correctly is in the power and strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, we, we've heard this illustration before of like growing. The Bible uses the illustration of growing as a, a child in God. Um, and I was... Uh, thinking about it yesterday as I, well, I didn't really realize when I was reading the Bible yesterday that God was preparing me for the messages this week, but it was because I was, you know, thinking of this thing of change. And, you know, we're, we're all afraid of change, um, even when change is good. I have been watching Aiden, you know, keeping him since he was three months old. And now it's getting to, the, I've had him every day, you know, and um, now it's getting to the point where they're looking at putting him into a, um, a preschool, which is great, but yet that's something different. You know, it, it's a great thing. It's something that's needed. And, but still, you know, I'm sitting here, a little selfish me, going, well, wait, but that, that changes my day. That changes what I'm going to do. You know, as we were talking about Isaac going back, this is a, a thing that um, uh, it, it's changed. It may be exactly what God wants to happen at this time. God's not uh, unaware of anything that we have going on, but at the same time, it's changed. Um, Kendall is about to go away to school. That's change. That can be scary. But these are all things that allow us to grow. They're all things that are, are, are there for us to grow. <coughs> I, I think about a child that's born, um, and we can equate a child that's born to someone that's new in salvation. And so there, whenever you know, a child is born and they're, they're fed and they're, they're clothed and they're changed and changing as the diaper, you know. Um, <laughs> I remember when I was at Bible college, there was an, not, not an argument, but a discussion. Somebody had went and visited a church and over the nursery door, there was a uh, Bible scripture, and it said, we may not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. <laughs> and there was a huge discussion as to whether or not that was <coughs> appropriate or not. I thought it was hilarious. But then again, those things that aren't, I think are funny most of the time. But uh, anyway, we're talking about change, you know, changing diapers and things. But can you imagine if you were a, or how you would feel if you were an infant and, you know, you were fed every day and you continued to grow. And then when you got about maybe six, eight, nine months old, you stopped being fed. You stopped getting something to drink. Nobody gave you a juice cup. 
and you know nobody was putting you down for your nap and you just you know you continued to grow in knowledge and life experience but your body wasn't growing and most of us wouldn't be thrilled about that most of us would be a little aggravated about that well can I tell you this as Christians we're like that child but the thing is we're responsible for feeding ourselves on the word of God and that's how we are we started off as infants that just got saved and you know most of the time everybody gets and I don't even want to call it on fire um, most of the time it's just like a big poof it's not a fire it's more like a little explosion and then we we, we grow and we learn a little bit more and we, we have a desire for the things of God we have a desire to be in the house of God but then as time goes on we get comfortable where we are and we stop feeding ourselves on the word of God we start stop giving ourselves rest that we have in communion with God in prayer and we stop you know getting something to drink we no longer have the uh, or we're no longer looking for the, the water of the Holy Spirit to, to fill us and to teach us each and every day and so if we were to physically look like we were spiritually as far as maturity goes a lot of us would be smaller Kendall <laughs> if that's the case but we love you to death Kendall um, but that's how we would look and so how do we grow well we've got to put ourselves into the word of God we've got to continue feeding ourselves we've got to continue to give ourselves rest when we're coming to God in prayer We've got to continue to allow and look for the Holy Spirit to teach us. And uh, I, I'll, I'll just share this. Yesterday, you know, I, I've been kind of a little down, a little overwhelmed. And, you know, I would say that my walk with the Lord had been a little stifled. And I just asked God yesterday morning when I was praying, I'm like, Lord, help me to grow. And it was hard for me to ask that because I was afraid he was going to come up with, you know, like you go to school and they give you like a stack of books and say, all right, here you go. You've got to the end of the week to read this and we'll have a test. But that's not what he did yesterday. God knew where I was. God gave me one small thing. One small thing. Something that um, I would get up every day. Nothing, there was nothing wrong with it. And I would maybe, um, you know, put on my earbuds and listen to the news or do some things like that while Suzanne was getting ready while I had my coffee. And um, there was just something in my morning routine. God said, stop it. And I didn't do it yesterday. And praise the Lord, he took the desire out of my heart yesterday. And I had a peace yesterday with God that I haven't had in a long time. But it was because I, God showed me there was something that needed to change. I was, and I, I had to change it. And in changing that, I can honestly say that I feel like that I've grown in that one little thing. And I don't say that. All the glory and honor to Christ for doing that in my life. All I did was obedient. And here's the thing. I was only obedient because he gave me the will and the strength to be obedient. It's nothing on me. But why are we so afraid of change? You know, when these things happen. Well, we're afraid of it because we... We all know, we can admit that we're all selfish. We don't like change. We like things going just as they are. I've shared with you before. I had, you know, these things that started happening in my life around 2008, I had this huge identity crisis. Everything that Daryl Gaines had been before then, I felt like was slowly being taken away from me one by one by one. And all of a sudden it was like, well, if you asked me last year who Daryl Gaines was, I could have given you a list. And now all of a sudden it's 2008, 2009, 2010. I don't know what to tell you. God had to break me down to start building me up to where he wanted me to be. And I'm far, far, far from that. Um, and I say that with absolute humility, but not, you know, this kind of fake humbleness where I, I know, I know that my problems are a lot of them because of my lack of obedience. But I just praise God. And I'm telling you today, we're going to talk about some things that are going to be kind of hard tonight, but God's going to give you the ability to do it. He's going to give you the strength to do it. He's going to give you the will to do it. And most of all, he's going to give you the reward for doing it. Um, you know, I'm one of these people, a lot of people say, well, we shouldn't do things for, for rewards. You know, if the Bible didn't want us to work for rewards, they wouldn't tell us we were going to give them. 
but the thing is, they're not rewards for us to hang around our neck or to put on our shelves or any or stack up on our heads. The rewards, rewards to give back to our Savior when we see Him face to face. That ought to motivate us. Um, but you know, one of the reasons I think is so hard for us to change is because we'll do a participation Wednesday night. If God tells you to change something, what's the purpose of the change? I, I, almost all, no matter what it is, what's going to be the purpose for God telling you to change it? His glory and our good. His glory and our good. His glory and our good. That's exactly right. Um, I told you we're going to be at chapter 11. I want us to back up to chapter 10. This is some scripture that we're very familiar with, but there are things that happen when we change for God. There are things that happen when we change for God. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry, Matthew. We were going to be in Matthew chapter 11, but we're going to look at some scripture in scripture, <laughs> scripture in Matthew chapter 10. The Matthew chapter 10 is what um, I believe we're going to be pretty familiar with. Um, this is when Jesus was sending out his disciples, you know, and he told them not to take anything but with them. Don't take any money, don't take any shoes, don't take anything extra, don't take a staff, you know, um, go. And we could do a whole series on all the things Jesus told them not to take with them, and we could see how they symbolically are things in our life that God wants us to put down when he sends us out. Because when these men went out, what did they go out with? The message of the gospel. That was it. That was all they went out with. No preparation. And guess what? Christ said it's enough. I guess if each and every one of us right now decided that we were going to go on a missionary trip, if we asked each one, what did we need to take with us, we would probably get, you know, a dozen different answers on what we felt like we would need. But if God sends us out as missionaries to bring the gospel, that's what he's given us. That's all we need. And so he's telling his, his uh, disciples as he was sending them out that um, they were going to be things that were going to be hard because they were going to be going out into a world of wolves and he's sending them out like lambs. And so, just as Gray said, when things change, it's for God's honor and glory. So if we look here at some things that could happen if we change for God's honor and glory then we'll see why we really don't like doing it. If we look in verse 16 of Matthew chapter 10, he says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up into the councils, and they will scourge you into synagogues. And you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. So that's something that I've I told everybody in here today. Now this here is Jesus talking about, talking to the Jewish people that he's uh, teaching. He's talking about delivering them up into the synagogues and things like that, you know, and against the Gentiles. But He's talking to God's people about what's going to happen to God's people when they start living for their God. And I don't think anybody in here would be anxious, or it's anxious, would be excited or looking forward to being accused of doing wrong when you've done the right thing. And the thing that you're being accused of, you are guilty of because it's the right thing to do. But yet what you're being accused of is going to get you possibly thrown in jail. It could get you beaten. It could get you killed. It could have your reputation ruined. You could ruin your, lose your job. Somebody could say something mean about you on the Internet. These are all things that could happen. And I think those are things that scare us because nobody looks for that. You know, um, I, I think of um, we, we, we're all wanting to serve God and we say that we're willing and, and maybe we are. Maybe in our heart it's like we can honestly say I don't care if I go through those things for the cause of Christ. We cannot care but we can still be anxious for them. We can still not want to go through them but yet be willing to. 
Um, those are all scary things. I think the next passage of Scripture is probably the scariest thing. Because if we're true, it's what we're actually, unfortunately, going to look at uh, right in our lives. It says here in verse 21, And the brother shall deliver up brother to death, and the father the child, and the child to rise up against the parents and cause them to be put to death. And he shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. <coughs> but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, they were talking about family against family. <coughs> and who's, who's being delivered up? It's the ones that are serving God. If we're all honest, each and every one of us are, you know, what's the old saying, no man is an island. Each and every one of us have a family. You have relatives. Some of you have family that live in your home. Some of you have extended family. But you have family. You know, there, there's a reason that there's a difference between the word friend and family. You know, you think that family is this connection, this bond that cannot be broken. You know, Suzanne, um, I, and I appreciate y'all's prayers. I mean, Pastor Bobby mentioned it. I did um, the services for Suzanne's aunt. It was very odd. Very odd because I did, um, well, I say odd. It wasn't odd. Well, God bless. But it was, it was an, an odd circumstance because... Um, they had me do both services over the phone and they had it hooked up to a Bluetooth speaker so I wasn't able to see anybody there. Um, I told Randy I may be the only person I can think of that doesn't live in Hawaii that actually did two funerals barefoot. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was this situation where there were people that you would have thought would have been there that weren't. People that were family. There were people that you never would have thought in a million years would have shown up. But they were there. They were family. You have two completely different sides here. But this thing of family, you know, that your family is a place or, and your family and your home is a place where you, you would think you would be safe. You know, you go home after work, and what do you, you know, you don't look forward to going home to more trouble when you get home than you had when you were out in the world. It's, it's a place of refuge. It should be a place of comfort, a place of rest. But here's the thing. No matter how good of a leader we are as Christians, husband and father, no matter how good of a um, a, a Christian wife or a Christian child that we are no matter how good we are we're all going to be on these different levels and we can all have maybe a different goal in mind and that's going to cause problems but if we're growing and we're continuing to go I mean how many, how many families do you think ever get um, uh, I'm not going to say get in trouble but how many families do you think have uh ought against each other because maybe a child is led to go to a certain school and the parents feel like they ought to do something else. Or the child feels like they've been praying and God's leading them into a field and the parents want them to go into something else. You know, there's something that's kind of simple and it's easy to wrap your head around how you can see those things happening. But what if God is leading a child to go in a certain direction and maybe the child's more spiritual than the parent is? And that's what's causing the issue. But here's the thing. That child's continuing to grow and continuing to change. If we continue reading here, I want us to go down to um, uh, verse... Uh, sorry, I just had it here. Um, verse 34. You know, Christ is called the Prince of Peace. And we know that one day he will bring eternal peace into eternity but that's he that's heaven that's eternity that's not now and Jesus was realistic and he was truthful I'm kind of redundant saying Jesus was truthful but what I mean is you can't accuse him of hiding anything if we read here in verse 34 he said think not that I am come to send peace on earth I came not to send peace 
but a sword. Is Jesus saying that he's advocating war? He's advocating fighting? He's things like this? No, but it's simply the fact that if you're trying to live for Christ, there is going to be disagreements and there is going to be um, the, the word that's used here a little bit later is variance. Variance. There's going to be a difference between you and other people. And we think that, we know that's going to be in the world, but here's the thing. It's going to be in our homes. It's going to be in our homes. And we're scared of that. We're frightened of that. No one wants to feel like they're responsible for putting a wedge between members of the family. But sometimes if we're serving God, that's what we've got to do. And Christ is very plain with this. He says, um, For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. That's pretty hard truth but that's the truth of what happens when we change for God is there somebody right now that you know that if you tried to share scripture with them or that you tried to I don't even want to say witness to them but if you tried to have a conversation about the Lord it would kind of end in a little bit of a I don't even want to say a disagreement but almost in hostility you know each and every one of us knows that how many of us look forward to that? Nobody. I can't tell you that it'll be okay. I can't tell you that that won't break up relationships. I can't tell you that that won't hurt and put you in a hard place in your life. But all I can do is tell you what the Lord said here. Because when we look at those things and we're like, well, I don't, I don't want to lose my daughter. I don't want to lose my son. I don't want to, we use this phrase, I don't want to push them away. We would say the same thing about our parents. You know, my parents are older, whatever. I, I don't want to push them away. Husband and wife. I don't want to put anything between me and my wife. Maybe things aren't great right now. I feel like this. If one of you serve a God, the other one's not, things aren't great. I don't care how they look. Things aren't great. But we would say, well, I, I don't want to break up my family. I don't want to be the one that breaks up my family. Let's look at what Christ said. Christ said, for he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. That's um, that's a pretty hard truth right there. But I think if, if we're honest with ourselves, we can say that we find ourselves loving someone more than Christ. Now, is there anything wrong with loving them? No. But when we put our family's feelings or that relationship ahead of the relationship that we have in Christ, Jesus says we're not worthy of him. Um, I, I wish, again, you know, a lot of times you feel like you want to give a message and you want to say, well, this is the answer to everything. We do this and we do this and we have this. Looking at this scripture right here, I can offer only one comfort for serving God and for changing him is that we're worthy to serve Christ. And I think if we're honest, if we can't say that that's enough, then that's why we need to look and say, we've got to change some things in our life. I've shared this with you before. Aiden, I love him to death. But I have to admit that at one point in my life, that child became an idol. He became an idol in my life. He was more important than anything else in my life. And I felt like what ended up happening is my relationship with the Lord suffered by it. Because I was focused. I was dead.
dead set on certain things. This was what God had called me to do, is to put other things aside and help take care of him the best that I could. And that, that may be true. But just as a pastor, a pastor is called to shepherd the church, to be the under-shepherd under the Lord Jesus Christ. But if that pastorate or the congregation or the duties or the business of the church become more important than Christ, then you need to be lost of life. So that's why I asked you, when was the last time we changed? And I think if we're honest, we would say, well, you know, if things are going great, we don't look to change. Because if, if there's something that's going on, what do we look like most of the, what do we look at most of the time for needing to change? Anything we can point at. That's what needs to change. You know, um, th this needs to be like this, and if it wasn't like that, I wouldn't have to respond that way. That's the reason I do what I do is because they do so and so. Um, this situation right here, you know, I don't want to have to be hateful and ugly and fight with people and uh, talk bad about them and all these different things, but, you know, you just don't understand what they do. Well, the one thing that wasn't mentioned there, you know, he talked about if a man loves his son, loves his daughter, loves his wife, if a wife loves her children or son or husband, Parents, anybody that you love, if you love it more, you're not worthy of him. The biggest one is if we love ourselves. We're not worthy of him. And that's ultimately what we end up doing. Again, it goes back to the selfishness thing. So uh, I'm getting, I ask again, why don't we like change? Because we're afraid of it. We're afraid of breaking the relationships we can see without looking at how it strengthens the one that we necessarily can't. So that's what we're going to be looking at, you know, um, just to give that little background. And we, we jump down then into um, chapter 11. And uh, this is a chapter where, you know, after this, Jesus has sent out the disciples. So Jesus is here, um, you know, basically when I say alone, as far as the disciples have gone out. And Jesus here is ministering by himself from what we see here in the scripture. And um, at the beginning of chapter 11, it says here that it was when John the Baptist had been thrown into prison. And he was questioning. He wanted to know, was Jesus the one that he had been sent to proclaim? Why do you think John asked that question? John's in prison for what he was preaching. He believed in the message but he started having doubts about the person. Have we ever done that? Have we ever read the scripture and believed 100% in what the scripture said? Yes, absolutely. I stand on this 100%. But when it came to our relationship with Christ, we started doubting that. And not, and it's just more we're doubting. It's like, Lord, you know, I'm, I'm praying, and you say X, Y, and Z in the scripture, and I'm claiming that promise, and I'm praying that way but I'm not seeing any result. I believe in the scripture, but I'm doubting you. If that happens, something needs to change. If that happens, something needs to change. You know, at the seminar, we've had several conversations over the years, you know, everything from standing in the middle of Walmart at four o'clock in the morning to when I had my surgery, uh, he came and sat with me as many others did, and we had a lot of good talks and just sometimes just some time of fellowship. But you know, that's like as ridiculous as saying sin is a liar and I don't trust him. But he told me X, Y, and Z and I believe that. How backwards would that be? If we believe in the message, we've got to 100% believe in Christ. We know that John believed in, in Jesus. He said, behold, the um, you know, the Lamb of God when he saw him. So let me ask you this, another participation thing. Why is it, why was John doubting? 
Why was John doubting that Jesus was the Messiah? If he had met him, he had baptized him, he was his cousin, you know, had known him throughout his life. And now John's in prison and he's starting to doubt. Why do you think that is? Well, I'll go ahead and help you with this one. It's pretty much because the Messiah didn't come the way the Jewish people were looking for him. Once he was proclaimed Christ, once he was proclaimed Jehovah, he proclaimed Messiah, once he was proclaimed these things, the Jewish people were expecting that's it. All our enemies are put down. We are raised up. We are God's people. The kingdom of God is going to be established. But that's not what happened. And the illustration has always been the Jewish people see two mountaintops. They see the Messiah coming, and they see the kingdom of God being established. What they don't see is this valley in between the two mountaintops, which is the church age. It was when God pushed the pause button on the Jewish people and their story and sent his son to be fully God and fully flesh in order to reach the Gentile people that were down there in that valley. So John, even John the Baptist, didn't see the valley, and he's looking for the other mountaintop. This is what Jesus answered. In verse 3 it says, And said unto him, Art thou that should come, or do we look for another? In verse 4 through 6, the Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who so, whoso, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. So what's Jesus telling them there? John was aware of the miracles that Jesus was doing. He was aware of that. But he didn't see what he was looking for. What was he looking for? He was looking for the kingdom of God to be set up. Okay? So when he's asking these things, he's almost asking, you know, um, in a, well, he definitely, uh, we can say from his question, he was doubting. Are you the one or not? Because I'm not seeing you do what I thought you said you were going to do. And Jesus answered and said, Look at all the things that are happening that couldn't happen without me. Okay? Now, if you believe in those things, then believe in me. I'm sure people were coming to John saying, you've been preaching that the kingdom of God was coming. You proclaimed this man as the Messiah. You proclaimed this man Jesus as the Christ. Where is the kingdom? We don't see it. And John was probably going through a little bit of shame. You ever speak up to somebody? Put your name on somebody? You ever talk to a boss or somebody and say, hey, you know, I think so and so's looking for a job. I've known them for a while. I think they'd probably be pretty good to work there. And you get there and they just are absolutely one of the sorriest human beings you've ever seen. I've had that happen. Or, you know, you, you, you just put two people in contact together and it, things just completely fall apart. You're getting embarrassed of that. You didn't do it, but you're the one that introduced them. You're the one that set things in motion. And you feel like they're looking at you going, well, I thought you said this was an okay guy. I thought you said that person was nice. I thought you said you could trust them. Man, I really got burned. What's Jesus saying to John here? At the end, he said, and blessed is he who so shall not be offended in me. Jesus is telling us, wait. Keep, keep proclaiming what I've told you to proclaim. John the Baptist, I don't think, was ready to go out of prison if he ever got out of prison. He was ready to call all his people together and say, hey, I might have been wrong about this guy because I thought he was going to do this, but so far he's not done it yet. I might be wrong. 
what Jesus is telling you is <clears throat> look at the evidence that I am who I said I was. Look at the evidence that I am who my father told you that I was. Look at the evidence of this. Now, because you don't see yet what you expect, don't doubt me. If you don't see it yet, don't doubt me. What God has you praying for, you may not see it in your lifetime. You may not. It may be a person. It may be a situation. It could be anything. But whatever it is you're praying for, you might not see it. But because you don't see it doesn't mean that God's not bringing it about. I imagine everybody in here probably has something that you've been praying for and you've not seen the result of. But I almost guarantee you've got so much more that you've seen Christ do in your life that you can look at. And Jesus is saying to us today, don't doubt me. You've not seen what you're looking for yet. But never let that doubt who I am. Let you doubt who I am. He's the Son of God. He's our Savior. So, John, when he asks this question, it's what we end up doing a lot of times. Something needed to change. John's thinking, okay, if you're the Messiah and you're who you say you are, you're making me look bad. You might want to go ahead and do what it is you're going to do. Jesus said, I am doing what I'm supposed to be doing. <clears throat> John says something needs to change. From John's perspective, he needed to change. But who needed to change? John. And what did John need to change? John needed to change his perspective. So the first, I'm not going to say the first part. I told Brother Randy I was trying to figure out how to do this like an outline. You know, like you have a subject and you have A, B, and C. That's how I told him on the CD to put uh, when did you last change and then put a little A beside of it. So I didn't want to scare anybody. Into, it's a three-part service or a three-part message. No, they're all individual, but they have the same thing. So tonight, let me ask you, when's the last time you changed? When's the last time that you changed your perspective of who Christ was? How many times was your perspective focused on an earthly relationship? Look, I'm not advocating that you go home and kick in the door and say, all right, you bunch of heathens, I'm going to live for God. I don't care what you do. I've done that. It don't work. No. <laughs> I, that's not what I'm saying that we do. I'm simply saying we go to God and we ask him to put our focus where it needs to be. You know, um, the <laughs> Lord did this earlier. I don't see very well, Grace, and she goes around and tells everybody her youth minister is blind. Um, but we, I was sitting there a while ago, and this little light thing back here had fallen down again. I don't have very good depth perception. If I was trying to throw something back there at Grace, I'd hit Randy right square in the face. I, do, I can't judge depth very well. So I'm sitting there, and I'm looking up here, and Randy put the thing up, but I'm thinking, where's the little clip hanging down there? Maybe if he just clipped that little clip up, maybe that'd be it. And I asked him, I'm like, what's that little thing hanging down? Is that a clip? And he's looking, and he's like, no, I'm like, how does he not see it? Well, from my perspective, I was seeing the little microphone down there. And I'm thinking, well, there's the problem. If he just clipped that little clip, that light would stay right on up there. My focus was wrong. My focus was wrong. Let's stop looking at our Christian life with no depth perception. Everything God's put in your life is important because God wants you to reach it. And he wants you to touch it in some way for him. But if when we're looking at things, if Christ ends up looking even or behind any of those things, then the first thing we need to change is our perception and our focus. Father, I do want to thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Lord, I just pray that I was um, honoring to you. Lord, I just pray that uh, the message was exactly what you would uh, have me to bring tonight and that you would have uh, each and every ear that's here and those that are listening at home, Father, that you would just uh, speak to our hearts and let it be what we need. 
Lord, I just pray that you would continue to work in my life and help me. I just pray that you would be with each member of Faith Baptist Church and anyone that hears this. Father, and help us to see that the things that need to change are us, whether it be an attitude um, or a relationship. Let us look at ourselves and have the right perspective on Christ and on this world before we go out and say or do anything. And Father, just help us to understand that if there's anything anything. Lord, you call us to honor our father and our mother, and you call parents to take care of the children. You tell fathers not to provoke children to wrath. You give us very clear and important um, scripture and instruction on how to deal with earthly relationships. But Father, even with all those instructions, they're never as important as our relationship with Christ. And Lord, help us to be willing. Um, no one's looking for it. But as Christ said in the garden, let, let this cup pass from him. Lord, if it's your will that some of these relationships are hindered because our relationship with you, the Lord Jesus Christ, is growing, then so be it. Help us to understand that and help us to have the rest that we need in you. Thank you again for letting us be here tonight, Lord. Just be with our pastor. Bring him back um, safely, Lord. Continue to be with his um, family. Be with all those that we mentioned tonight, Lord. And I just thank for thank you for each and every one that's here. Lord, just bless the ones that weren't able to be here tonight for whatever reason in a special way. We'll be careful to give you the praise, honor, and glory for who you are. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. Y'all are dismissed.